Good morning, Misfits. You are tuning into a special edition Misfit podcast. Today, we are going to be doing a deep dive into our next training phase. We use these to get people excited for what's coming at misfitathletics.com, um, give you guys a little bit of background on how we think about programming, some insight into kind of the plan of what we're trying to tackle more long term, and then hopefully give you the kind of information that'll allow you to execute on what you are doing. Before we do that, this episode of the podcast is brought to you by Sharpen the Axe. You can head to sharpentheaxeco.com. Use the code word PAGE, P-A-I-G-E. You save 10% on your order. Paige gets 10% towards her 2024 CrossFit Games journey. Properfuel.co. Use the code word MISFIT. And if you want to get started on phase zero, make sure you head to misfitathletics.com. If you're an affiliate owner, Phase one is starting pretty soon for our affiliate programming, uh, mid-August. That's actually going to be an episode coming up. Um, if you want to dig into that, head to teammisfit.com or the Sugar Wad Marketplace. As always, before we get into the nitty-gritty, we've got a little bit of life chat. What's going on, gents? Hunty, what's going on? I am within, uh, I was telling Drew and Ted and Jen the, yesterday, I'm within uh, within striking distance of a single digit handicap in my golf golf extravaganza. You're going to be able so, to park super close to the front door at Walmart? <laughs> probably like halfway, like halfway okay. to the front door at Walmart. That's what yeah. that gets you. Tell me the significance of yeah. that because I don't understand how, in, like, is that really impressive or do you suck and you finally got there? Like. I assume it's uh, probably impressive. I, I would say <laughs> I would say it's it's pro, it's a little ahead of the curve for okay. playing golf for over a year, a little okay. over a year. So to yeah, that the handicap system is basically like just a measure of how good you are relative to to other people. Could you so, beat Donald Trump mean, in a golf outing? Donald Trump is allegedly a two point five handicap, which means on like average he shoots. He might shoot like re- on a really good day. Might shoot like two over par, which like is very good. Seventy-four. Yeah, so like mid seventies. I saw that I did. fucking eagle he made. I did. Yeah, he's got. He's just the old man. Like you can tell, he golfs pretty, a lot. He golfs a lot. He's got one of those golf he golfs asses. a lot. <laughs> giant <laughs> dump truck of an ass. He's got a giant dump truck. Got the the swing that isn't all that pretty, but good enough for government work i suppose is the the best term so mm-hmm. who knows how uh how honest his scores were that got him to a 2.5 handicap but i think he's he is known <laughs> for that but uh either way i mean you could tell he's got you could tell he golfs and golfs like at least well enough to have fun i mean sure I guess, if you but. if you think back i'm sure you've played nine holes of golf before at least if not 18 could shoot 100 on he's nine. at hunter's averaging <laughs> half a stroke off par per hole if he gets to nine that's like yeah on a, on a very good, good day yeah yeah that's pretty good. yeah it's coming along it's coming along club championship at the uh end of august so we'll see win. uh see if i can get that i'm gonna enter the uh the net division so there's two divisions a gross and a net gross just basically means like if i shoot if I shoot 120, like my score is 120. The net division, basically, you take handicap. into account your handicap. So I'll be, you know, if I'm a 10 handicap, I might be playing against somebody else who's a 15 or a 7. Is there like a seven. Could I be like a 400 handicap going into this? You could. The ceiling is in the other direction. So for us, if you're four. a 5 hand, if you're a 5 or better, you have to compete. Go in gross. Like, go in the gross division. Yeah. Um, that's, that's gross. So yeah tracking all right fun (laughs) yeah it's a fun it's a unique it's unique in the sense that it just allows anybody in the world who tracks their scores to like compete fairly against each other so sure even if you started and tracked your handicap for like for 20 rounds or you had 20 scores like you and i could compete against each other fairly you would just get a lot more strokes how irritating would that be though if you got paired up to compete against someone who's absolute dog shit and has like i don't know what's what's a crazy handicap 25 30 
It's a problem. People do that. People will deliberately that that. like, <laughs> yeah, they're called. Yeah, they get you can go in like either direction. They call them sandbaggers. If you like shoot well, but you don't report your score. So your handicap is artificially higher and therefore you get more strokes. So like, you know, you could theoretically That's play so significantly better. Pretend it's that so you're bad. it's so weird. Yeah, I I didn't realize that was a thing when I kind of started. I was like, I would do it in the opposite direction. Like, I don't like I hate submitting like publishing scores that are bad because I like want to see my handicap get better. But the the opposite they call it a grand bagger, someone who only submits like good <laughs> scores. So your your bagger. handicap is low. Cross but, grand like, bagger. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm across a grand bagger. Give me a fucking <laughs> squat snatch workout with some handstand walks. Grand bagger. Yeah. <laughs> do you do that one today, Sherb? Yeah, we have to do wall walks here, though, because I don't get the floor space. But yeah, uh, that was, yep. it was a fun workout. I like those kind of workouts. <laughs> how I far asked did you get? How it was, and they said they basically gotten old enough that their wrists just hurt. <laughs> That's basically <laughs> what Amanda said. Uh, I finished the round of seven squat snatches and got one wall walk in eight. So I basically did one squat snatch, two wall walks, two squat. Oh, snatch, you did wall, wall walks, walks too. Yeah, I just I took I did it before class, but I just like I want to compare to everybody else, so I just did the the wall walk version. So two three goes wall walks of two, three, four, all the way up as high as you could. It's a shitty um, workout. I mean, it was good. It was a good workout. I like the handstand walk version. That's probably a better one for me than the wall walk version. But um, I don't know. It was just barbell didn't feel very heavy it's just one of those ones where you can't go super fast because if you do you just end up standing around somewhere so you just kind of are methodical back and forth yeah it was way more fun than yesterday got anything else sherby um i learned that my second child is not afraid of water and if you are in the water and he is on the dock and you are looking in his direction whether or not you actually are looking at him or just in his direction he's just going to walk off the dock he just doesn't <laughs> jump he just walks and he just face plants into the water and like because my sunglasses are polarized i'd be like might be looking at his brother who's like a foot or two to his left or right but i'm looking in his direction off he goes so a couple of times i had to rescue him from you know bobbing up and down like an apple or an apple in the water i was just like <laughs> what are you doing dude i'm not like i have to like hold my hand up like no stop wait because otherwise he's just gonna walk off and he just walks off and it's exactly what you think it is as if the water, as if the dock continued and he was just going to keep walking. So it's just face plant. That's some American psycho shit. You'd at least so expect him to a, like a, run uh, and he's belly flop. probably a vest, but that can mean that you're just floating with your face in the water too. Yeah, right? the vest doesn't work for shit. Yeah. We bought a vest yeah. and the strap that works goes, in both directions. That, that goes under the grundle <laughs> to keep this vest up from choking him in the throat. Like that thing ripped off like a week into having it. It was like the highest rated one on Amazon. I'm like, sick. Um, so there's that. And the second of all, if you put him in the water and it's like knee deep, he'll walk out until his face is submerged. He'll walk his face underwater. And I'm like, dude, you can't breathe underwater. So I have to like keep carrying him back to the shore and he would just walk right back out and you just see the water go. And then he, I like, mean, it's good out. that he's comfortable with water. I know you yeah. said that your kids would have to play water sports after both, the, both of their parents tore their Achilles. They or do. At least Ted said that. <laughs> they, they do have to play water sports. That's the requirement in our house. But it's just wild. It's just like no fear at all. Op complete opposite of Zion. Zion was like, eh, that water's cool over there, but it'll stay over there. <laughs> but does he see Zion in the water? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He's seeing Zion in the that's water. Such a huge, that's such a huge difference. They talk about firstborn, their only basis for how to be a human is an adult. Mm -hmm. And then secondborn, a third of what they're taught is from a little child. That's terrifying for my <laughs> So children. their like behaviors are like like that, like however much time they spend with them is the percentage of like monkey see, monkey do there. That's yeah. why you get the whole like firstborns being like rule followers and um things of that nature. And then the second born's like, fucking let's party. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's it's wild. He literally just walk out until he's drowning. I'm like, dude, stop. That's and I couldn't get him to stop. I had to like stay in shallow enough water that if I was standing, his head was above the water because if I went any deeper, he'd just walk out there again and walk out there again. And it's just funny. Cause like he starts in like, <laughs> he starts in like knee deep water and eventually he like loses his step and falls like, and he face plants in the water. And then he like bobs for a second and he tries to roll to his back. So he's like starting to understand like how to roll over a little bit in the water, even though we haven't done any real like swimming training, which is kind of nice, but it is still terrifying that like I take my eyes off him for a second and he's, <laughs> he's bobbing up and down in, in, in knee deep water. Yeah, Carter had his first boat ride experience, and of course, because he did, Maya was like, he has to have a life jacket on, and we're on Spalding Lake, 
in Oakfield, Maine on a pontoon boat. Um, so the first two times he went on the boat, he was fucking pissed about that life jacket. Like they had two different, they had two different like infant ones and one of them like was a little bit small for him. So he hated that. And then the other one would like ride up and push into his cheeks. Yeah. <laughs> and he was, so by the third ride, she was okay with me holding him. She was like, went through every disaster scenario that was possible. And it's a like shark crashing a pontoon boat boat would be the slowest <laughs> situation like ever crash the paddle boat. exactly like you could get seven life vests on him while we sank into the water and then swam 20 feet to be able to get out of it but he was fucking mad <clears throat> yeah dude they do not like all right so vests. so my my life chat is a bit of a follow-up to our nutrition um hydration body composition episode um one of the things that really sort of dawned on me after we did the episode was um i have or i did for the third time succumb to dad bod within the last 15 months so i was back in a calorie deficit and we talked a lot about that strength to body weight ratio the amount of lean mass you need to have maybe nudged a few people to get into that calorie deficit to improve their standing in the sport um you can't hold your paces on machines, you can't hold your paces in Metcons. You have to be incredibly energy efficient in terms of like, okay, so we're in a calorie deficit. We aren't supplying the body with anything extra. It has to be good at going to get that fuel off of your body fat to be able to go. So there's obviously different energy systems that are good at that um, and certain energy systems where that doesn't work at all. So I just kind of want to put it out there that while you are cutting, um, give yourself a little bit of leeway when it comes to your gears, um, you know, your Watts per kilo when you're doing zone two work, anything like that. Um, it is not like performance based. Obviously you can make sure that you are getting enough carbs and enough protein. Um, but it's definitely different and it pops into my head because I was at like 2,500 calories for three weeks. It was very noticeable in conditioning pieces and then as of today, literally, I'm back up to 3,100 for maintenance, and I'm so excited about it. Um, that's a kind of a side note. <laughs> and then we talked about, um, we gave a ton of information on hydration, and we talked about how, like, people don't track hydration. It's just not the kind of thing that, like, and, and I think those, I agree or at least i put it out there that those apps kind of suck like even my garmin one you have to add by cups you can change the units to ounces when but you hit plus it adds eight ounces and i'm the kind of person where like if i drink 23 ounces i want to put 23 ounces in my fucking thing um so not that helpful so i did go out and do it you we did. have here if you're listening if you're watching on youtube you see we have the Got it on Amazon, the AquaFit. See Aqua a skim Blaster, milk 6, gallon jug with the yes. label ripped off. It has the fucking timing on it over here. <laughs> um, that was not intentional, but it is actually kind of helpful. Um, it's got a straw. It's got a handle. It's got a fucking spout. So basically, I do my Amazon. calculations. Yep. <laughs> and I do my calculations in the morning um, most days. So baseline again half of your body weight in ounces that's freedom units so it's pounds so if i weigh 200 pounds i need 100 ounces really change the name to freedom units right like, um, of water and then um <laughs> if you want to sort of go based on conventional wisdom um your body weight divided by 30 for every 15 minutes of exercise and sweating you're due you're going to do and then if you want to go listen to the to the episode we talk about how to do a sweat test to actually find out what that looks like um so i calculate that in the morning and i put it in this bad boy and i sort of pay attention to it um over the course of the day and then that means i need to pay closer attention to my electrolytes and what i'm sort of replenishing there and what i can do to retain water a couple of little things that change it like if i get in the sauna i know you know 20 to 30 minutes in the sauna i'm gonna lose to lose at least a pound so 16 ounces of water get added in there, but it's something that you can play with. And I think if we go back and look at those charts about what happens um, when you are dehydrated, even certain percentage points and what happens to your performance, this becoming something that is like 
part of the culture of how we talk about nutrition, hydration, all of that stuff being there. So, um, a bit of a, like, don't talk about it, be about it moment. I wanted to fucking go get the silly water jug and carry the thing around. <laughs> I did say on the last podcast, I wasn't going to be that tool that drank out of it, but it is kind of convenient to drink out of it. So even day one, I probably drank half of it while still in this <laughs> ridiculous fucking jug. <laughs> so, um, little bit of a nudge for other people to, to give it a shot, to do those equations, to see if you notice a difference in your training and just the kind of thing that if you can turn it into a habit, maybe you get a little bit better with it. Yeah. And you can also use the, the uh, like weigh yourself before, weigh yourself after thing. If you're someone that's yep. you know doing something that's longer endurance based, or you just know you're going to be in the elements and you're not in the confines of your nice, cool gym. Like a really easy thing is whatever you're going to get ready to do a workout in, take a weight measurement, do that workout, come back, weigh yourself and you can get a, like a better perspective on how much water you actually lose. Cause you know, there are certain things we try to estimate you know, you try to estimate how many calories you burn in a workout or how many, uh, you know, how many calories you should eat after workout based on what you did. And usually they're, you know, they're swinging, unfortunately, in the wrong direction. You know, we assume that like a seven minute Metcon is like 2000 calories of burn and, you know, that mm -hmm. cheeseburger deluxe is 10 calories. Like it doesn't work that way. But, you know, the water thing works really well. You know, you lose a pound, you lose two pounds. You know, that's sort of a bare minimum you got to put back in your body if you want to be kind of at your baseline. And for a lot of people more often than not in an under hydrated state. So you probably should go a little above and beyond that as well. Yeah. And we talked about the importance even more for a CrossFitter versus the, your average gym goer. Um, what I've noticed, and it's only been a couple of days, but I've noticed that I have to ask myself to drink more water in the front half of the day. Typically, I think I was probably getting maybe 75% of my allotment but over 50% of that was during and post-workout. So it's clearly dehydrated going into the workout and trying to make up for it there. So the biggest difference that I notice is like from whatever, 7 a.m. to 12 p.m., the amount of water that I have to drink is significantly higher. And knowing that that whole every 15 minutes thing is not going to be doable in a lot of scenarios in CrossFit, going into the workout with a little extra hydration, I think, is something that... Um, could be super beneficial to people. As we talked about how 25% um, of what you're supposed to get is what people normally um, do if they go just based on thirst. Well, it's so. funny you say that too, because I, I find myself doing the opposite. I'll get up in the morning, I'll crank the athletic greens with some electrolytes, I'll have some coffee. If I work out in the morning, I'll have a protein shake, and then I might sip some water the rest of the day, but then mm. I'll go home and I'll drink like a fucking 12 pack of seltzer. Like I will literally just crank can after can after can. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, fuck, I bought this. I bought these four 12 packs for the whole week and I'm fucking through one of them in one night. I'm like, yeah, I, I have need seen to do a better this before, job. ladies and gentlemen. He is not exaggerating. Yeah, no, it used to be, yeah. used to be Sunday. You'd make some nachos and you'd crank at least one 12 pack of seltzer. <laughs> at least probably fucks pack. with your sleep too. When you eat, when you just drink that much later in the day, you just gotta I wake up find, piss six times. Yeah. I thankfully like, I don't know the fucking a bladder of a camel i can hang on to it for a while but it yeah, definitely knows some some mornings or i'm getting up at like four or five a.m that's me like i don't get up at like the midnight or one or two in the morning it's like i'll get up an hour or two before my normal and be like i'm gonna yeah. explode if i don't go to the bathroom right now so i definitely try to do a little better job of it during the day and when it's hot i think it's easier just because you're naturally more thirsty but i think uh you know it's a good remembrance to even when it's cool <laughs> cool outside you sweat more than you think very true. All right. Uh, phase zero. So phase zero um, is something that we do every year leading into our off-season training where the entire community comes back together for phase one. So semifinals athletes are, are back on the program. Some games athletes are back on the program, you know, at a certain point there. Um, and basically what we're doing is we take five weeks, typically at the beginning of August, Monday, August 5th is when phase zero starts this year misfitathletics.com get signed up um and the idea behind it is not having the information to execute on the program before you start on it will significantly decrease the efficacy of the program 
If you have no clue what your percentage base lifts are supposed to be based on, if you don't have information about your cube tests, we'll get into what those are. Um, if you don't know compared to the misfit community at large, how well you execute on a certain style of workout, when you go to personalize and choose your extra pieces, you're going to not going to know exactly where to go with all of that. So it's super important to take this time, um, to refocus, figure out what our baselines are and go into phase one, two, and three with the information that allows us to excel. Like even just from a mental standpoint, there are, there's, there's something big about the like momentum in using the right weight for like a squat cycle. We go in, we use the right weight for a squat cycle and two athletes who are, let's say they're executing on the same level for the first few weeks in Metcons and intervals and bitch work. And one of them continuously is able to add weight as they go through the linear progression of the back squat phase. And then somebody else went full meathead on it and said that their max was, you know, something from when they weighed 30 pounds more or when they played football or who knows what it is. You use that, you start to get it in your head that you're not as strong as you used to be. You start to fall off in certain things. There's a lot of ramifications to, again, certain parts of the programming not being as beneficial to you as they could be. And while doing one rep maxes over the course of five weeks and doing benchmark workouts is a very high level of intensity, we make sure to keep the volume low and we really believe in the idea of like, have the most information going into phase one so that you can actually succeed. I had that conversation actually with one of my remote athletes. Uh, it was Kelly as we're like, she's kind of in the thick of, uh, games prep for masters and um her training's been she's she's juggling a lot of priorities we'll say that uh like a lot of masters athletes are and we were talking about some of the lifting stuff and she was maybe a little bit discouraged feeling like she wasn't as strong as you know as she was when she was training significantly more and there's obviously a whole different conversation that gets attached to that but then i was like well what are we using let's take a clean for example like what are what are you using for your one rep max and she's like 245 and i was like okay so you hit 245 or two 252 and i was like oh so the the squat clean that you made in quarterfinals in your peak physical condition leading up to the year you qualif missed qualifying for the CrossFit Games by a single point. It's like, yeah, I can understand why you might get discouraged that the percentages are not, you know, as easy as they might feel like they should be given that, you know, the strength you have in that lift. But, you know, using that one rep max, that's like, you know, when the stars aligned and when the vibes were right or when it was in competition, it's like, we can't use that for the most part. And that's the benefit to phase zero where it's like, yeah, you're going to come in on Monday, August 5th and find a one rep max power snatch, you know? And it's like, that kind of allows you, we still obviously want people to go heavy, but we want you to find like an accurate representation of what you are capable of now so that you can use the percentages correctly. And even if you find that you, your one rep max, let's take a more like a, a more common one, like a back squat. Like even if your back squat is say 10% less than your all time max, it's like, that's fine. That's going to allow you, like you were kind of saying, Drew, to do the percentages that are written. It's going to allow you to add weight each week because most of the lifting that we do is linear progression, meaning it's just going to get slightly heavier every week for the duration of the phase. And then when you go to retest or you have the opportunity to go heavy again, it's not like you are just, it's like, oh, but I'm, I'm not going to be as strong as I ever was. I might only just be a little stronger than my phase zero test. It's like, that's not exactly how it works. Maybe that'll happen, but it's also possible that you were going to hit a lifetime PR because you backed off the percentages. You were able to hit the lift well. You're getting the right positions. You were able to successfully complete the entire phase without missing lifts or, or failing reps. And lo and behold, the number goes up. So it's really important that we're, especially with the one rep maxes, that you guys have accurate representations of what you're capable of in, you know, non-competition sort of a non-competition setting uh so that because that's how that's effect that's how your training is 
my mind goes to the if you drop the percentages some um, for a lot of these lifts it isn't necessarily brute strength but skill you don't have the motor patterns dialed in and maybe you're a little rusty on something and using something that's potentially 10 to 20 percent heavier than it should be on average uh for an athlete just based on the fact that you know you're using 250 as your pr and your pr right now is probably close to 225 that's you know all your lifts are 10 percent heavier than they should be and then the adaptation that's supposed to hap occur you know between 60 and 70 percent or 70 and 80 or 80 and 90 are are not truly happening because they're you know the outside of the percentage range where those adaptations occur you know if we give you a lift that's in the 60 to 70 percent range it's about moving fast with skill if we give you a lift that's you know in the 80 five plus range it's about you know the cns stimulus that you get from that and it's you're not going to get the true optimal stimulus by being outside of what the range should be for yourself and that's a hard pill to swallow but if you if you can't wrap your mind around that you're essentially just kind of spinning your wheels in the mud yeah and it's man it's a very easy concept from the coach's chair we'll call it to talk about how moving 70 percent of your one rep max for fives makes it easier to move 80 percent of your max at fours and then finally at the very end of the squat cycle that you'll see in phase one you're battling triples at 90. we need something that is like underneath what you're capable of to create momentum and then something that's a little bit challenging in the middle and then finally at the end with all of those hours logged we are going to ask you to do like three by three at 90, um, which is something that's very challenging and you need to build to that point. If weeks one, two, three, or even four of a seven week squat cycle are really challenging, then something is wrong mechanically, mobility wise, whatever it is. So it's super important that within the proximity of actually doing these strength cycles that we know what our max is and you know, I've had numerous situations where an athlete has had to trade a like getting higher and higher levels of fitness for a few pounds in a lift and they always end up higher on every single leaderboard in those scenarios. Like whether you have to change your body weight, whether you have to lift less often to get your conditioning to where it needs to be, um those are things that really matter a lot. So um super important on the lifting side to get accurate representation of your one rep maxes, um, it will completely change how well all of the lifting goes for you throughout the entire year. I mean, um, what's, what's a better runway to into the upcoming season than to have a very successful phase where you move really well and you see progress and you know you're not doing the the squats and come weeks five six and seven you're you know you're failing the percentage work and then you're already discouraged and you still have you know fuckload of time six months before it actually matters but you've yep. already started off on this like negative like oh well i guess i'm not as good as i used to be like what kind of a poor runway is that leading into you know the bulk of when the training really truly matters like you were setting the foundation to be both in the right mindset and the right setup to move as well as you can and be as good as you can for the upcoming season and if you go into phase one thinking that like the best days are behind you that's it's not really a good place to be truth um so you will notice in phase zero there are named workouts um almost all of them are, are inside jokes um so either you know us really well and you know what they mean or on the off chance um you know who enzo gorlami is um but these workouts are a mix of stimulus and time domain so you will have a short a medium and a long misfit benchmark within the cardio stimulus that is a merry-go-round type of workout the kind of workout where there's probably at least one element that your speed so let's say it's a triplet of rowing wall balls and deadlifts the deadlifts and the wall balls are done unbroken very manageable and then your row pace is fast enough that you get the best score but slow enough that you can just hop off the rower get your wall balls done get your deadlifts done be back on the rower so that's what the cardio stimulus looks like. We have three. Oh, you're gonna go double there. under that. The first open workout's a perfect example. Yeah, yeah. Twenty minute row double under deadlift. Um, muscle endurance. We are going to try to stop you from going unbroken because you can't hold on to the pull up bar. 
Uh, your midline is not showing up anymore because you're doing skiing and GHD sit-ups. Um, your, you know, your again, your grip is gone. Your pressing is gone. Whatever it is, we want you to have to strategize in those moments to have the athlete IQ to know where to break certain things up, how fast your transitions should be, etc. We also have a short, medium, and long gas tank workout. The idea there is to make the combination so spicy that if you try to go unbroken or you try to push every single element, you will probably have ridiculously slow transitions and probably not get a very good score. So I'm going for a really high heart rate type of workout there. And then last but not least, all three of those uh, time domains, we also have chippers. Um, the chippers are, I don't want to say non-traditional, but like the long one is like a kitchen sink workout. It's like old school, like filthy 50 or any of the hero type workouts. There's a lot of movements in it. Um, your affiliate owner would kill you if you tried to do it during class. It's got every machine and dumbbells and barbells and the whole nine. But it's the kind of thing where you can start to work through in your mind how you mind. would attack something like that. Um, I'll fucking do it. So when you're looking at those each day... It's really important to compare your scores to other people who you consider in your kind of element and zone because that's when you can find out like, okay, I really suck at, maybe I suck at the medium time domain across the board. Maybe I suck at muscle endurance across the board. Or, you know, when I go long and it's cardio, I have a tough time holding up the pace, whatever it is, you're going to notice patterns within testing these, especially if you can compare them to other people. Um, and you can do that in discord. You can do that on fitter. You can do that within your own gym, Hunter, whatever it ben is. Smith. Don't forget to What's call that? him out again. Hunter can call Ben Smith, see where he's at. Yep. yep. Time, it's time for the rematch. Definitely. It's been, it's been nearly a decade. It's time for the rematch. <laughs> Over a decade. It's, third, it's 14, right? Yeah, you're 14, right. I guess it's, been, yeah. Yeah. it's time for a rematch. Which one, you picking? That smoke. Which, which one you picking? You're going head to head, Hunty. Uh, which one you picking? I don't know. 30 handstand, thirty feet handstand walk for time. Isn't that in there? Did I program <laughs> yeah, that? I think so. That sounds right. Program. <laughs> <laughs> um, you will also see our cube tests. Um, those are these lovely little uh, monostructural intervals. Four rounds of four minutes on, four minutes off for max calories. They're either on a given machine so you do all four rounds on the rower or quote unquote the cube test has all three concept to machines and running in it um real lovely so that gives you running. a lot of baseline for for the rest of the year and the other cube tests that we do um i would rather see someone uh take some chances or have weird round to round splits during phase zero that spit out an average where you have something to chase in phase one, two, and three. I think it's more important that you understand what you're capable of in a cube test on a given machine to then really push yourself in your test retest in phase one, two, and three. So if you've never done them before, um, there's a pretty good chance that you're either going to, to have a real, real rough round two or you're going to get a little bit faster because you undershot it. We see that a lot. see that a lot with athletes because the four minutes rest – is um, a little bit more ro robust than they're used to within a, a, a um, conditioning test. Um, that does happen a decent amount, but I think it's like a break a few eggs to make an omelet type of situation when you're doing your phase zero cube test. If you already have the information, um, obviously that's not necessarily the case, but we get a lot of new uh, followers during phase zero and phase one. So um, don't beat yourself up if you have a score that's kind of all over the place as long as you get an average across the four and you feel like you know what you would do um, when you did it again. Yeah, and I think you should think about those cube tests. Like, they are... They they do test obviously your capacity on the get on the machine and there's obviously with the exception of the bikes you know a, a technical component to it but the cube tests are more about testing your kind of anaerobic threshold it's right in that right in that ideal zone of you know it's not a power output thing it's neither is it a a long endurance or like oxidative energy pathway sort of thing it's right in the middle where most of the sport is actually tested from a you know from a testing standpoint whether it's the open quarterfinals or beyond um being fit 
in that cat in that in that area that kind of anaerobic threshold lactate threshold pathway is is critical to your success in the sport so more more about testing energy systems than like the exact machine per se sure. but once you obviously have enough fitness then it becomes a little bit about like you know can you improve your ski score can you improve your row score bike whatever it's very intentional that when you look at it you have to ask yourself is this short is this medium is this long i don't know what the fuck this is this is just, you have to execute on four minute zone. windows yeah you have to execute on four minute windows but then when we give you four minutes of rest that's when your aerobic system can sort of operate in the background and get you back to baseline um yep. of course or not six, or not <laughs> yes of course <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah i'll just I'll go ahead yeah go ahead and raise my hand um, but that's the that's that. that's the value of the test right exactly. it's like okay you got the power to go hard for four minutes excellent now do you have the you know aerobic capacity to flush and do it again and if you don't if you're if you know if you do that you come out either too hot or you just peter out and die uh you know that might be more indicative of you know spending time in the mf2 sessions than you know just hammering yourself with cube tests but a lot of information to be gained in those monostructural tests We've got a lot of monostructural time trials as well, and this is actually the only time of the season that we use these, um, but it kind of blows my mind that people are extremely serious about their um, competition aspirations within the sport, and they don't know what their 5K run and their 10K run are. Those are things that you absolutely need to know, and the you cool scared? thing is if you know, know anything scared. about uh a little bit of simple arithmetic you can get a decent idea of what your paces would be in a given workout by multiplying the distance or the time by the amount of rounds that you're doing cuz i know that if i can go run a 5k in say 20 minutes that a something that has 20 minutes of running in it with rest that i probably should have to push myself to go a little bit faster there's a, there's a lot of monostructural conditioning, a lot of mandatory monostructural conditioning early on in the off season. So when you're looking at those things and you're like, I haven't figured out where my gears are at yet, that's an excellent place to start. Um, so really important that you have those numbers. Um, you're going to see tests like that pop up at competitions. If they're well-programmed, you want to know what you're capable of holding on certain machines or going out and running for any given period of time, distance, et cetera. Such a bummer when people don't do that math because you essentially undersell yourself. You don't spend the five minutes to figure out how long something takes or how hard you should go. And then you either blow up 25% of the workout or you get done the workout and go, ah, I should have gone harder. Like, you know, it's okay to make those mistakes early on, but if you repeat those mistakes, it's kind of on you. And that might be the reason why you're not making the leap you're, you know, you're trying to make. You got to pay attention. You have to know this stuff. Like it's, you know, I, I don't come on down too harsh with remote clients when I say it, but it's like inexcusable not to know those. And if you don't know those, guess what I'm going to make you do? Like, oh, you don't know what your your 2K row time should be for, you know, 2K row minus five seconds per 500? I have no idea. All right, go row 2K. Let me know how it goes. Well, and, and you <laughs> want to know too, like, like I, there we will have people who, I don't want to say accidentally qualify, but there are people that qualify for stages of competition that they didn't think they were going to just based on their GPP. And then they're asked to do something like a 10 K row or to do a, even just a mafetone, you know, a zone two ski or something like that. You want to know if you mentally cannot handle sitting on a rower for 45 minutes. Cause that's a problem. Like if you want to be a competitor, you need to be ready for certain things. And there are a lot of people with a lot of fitness and a lot of grit within these disgusting time domains that are like, my butt bones hurt on the seat and say shit like that. And it's like, this is <laughs> the, like the easiest of the time domains when it comes to intensity. Um, but there's a level of focus and like, I need to log my hours to get used to this. So if you are skipping things, that's a, <laughs> that's a big red flag. Or if you're quitting while you're doing it, then you're the type of person that needs to make sure that you are getting that second day a week of zone two, even if you are on hatchet. Cause it's like, if I'm not willing to to sit down on this machine or to go for a jog for this period of time, you might not be cut out for continuing to progress through the sport and get asked to do something like insanely grueling. Like they might ask you to go run that long with 30 pounds on your back. 
how's that going to go if you can't do it if you can't go run 12 minute miles for an hour like it's probably not going to be very fun right i just think back so, to like the, the half marathon row or like nowadays if someone threw out a half marathon row at the cross the games i you guarantee i don't think you see one person get up off that rower and stretch but the year we went and saw that like fucking half the field had to get off the rower my some back people hurt. did it as a strategy too and i'm yeah. like damn you you guys really do suck at math it's incredible <laughs> <laughs> Nah, like, you're, I you're mean, gonna what's, what's going to happen with Chad? I don't know. That's going to be so fun. I'm so excited die. for that. They're going to die. So excited for that. I mean, yeah, the, the other thing, just it's all, all those are your one rep max lifts. Like you take your, you take your percentage work with your lifting seriously, knowing what your one rep max 2K row is allows you to do your rowing at a percentage work. Yeah, I, I skipped that day for sure. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's it's it effectively just gives you the chance to do percentage work. We just the difference is that we just don't put, you know, three rounds row five hundred meters at one hundred and ten percent of your two K row. Like maybe if we put right. percentages there, we would people would Next be like, one. Oh yeah, that I'll do that. Like great. Like, but you need to know what you're capable of, just like Drew said. So you can do some math, you can do a little bit of interpolation if it's in a Metcon or like there's going to be, I don't know, however many fucking bitch work pieces over the course of the next year where it says like two and a half minutes on, two and a half minutes off of rowing. It's like, what's your pace? It's 135. I don't fucking know. Not including zone two. That's how many bitch work What's pieces? your major, dude? <laughs> 135. A Perfect. So a lot of, a lot of pieces to, to be able to use that information on so that you can, you know, approach it correctly. Um, all right. So one thing, again, because of all the, the new people in phase zero and phase one is choosing your program. Um, this is really important. This is like a fucking pause and get your pen out. This is as simple as it gets. I am going to semifinals or the CrossFit games in 2025. I should sign up for the MFT program. I am competing in the open quarterfinals and have maybe an outside chance of making it to semifinals. I am doing the hatchet program. That is obviously a large group of people. We convinced two MFT level athletes in the last two years to follow hatchet. McKenna Enslin qualified for semifinals for the first time following hatchet. You can go look up her scores. She came in like somewhere between 16th and like 25th or something like that in quarterfinals because she peaked four quarterfinals. Really important here. Brandon True, same kind of situation. Like so many things that he does are MFT level. Um, and he asked, what should I be following here? Because he listens to the podcast regularly. Um, lo and behold, he qualifies for semifinals this year. So I really want to put it out there is a larger community. There's more people to compare scores to. There are more opportunities to have higher intensity within the actual sport of CrossFit year round. Please only follow MFT. If you know, you're going to semifinals of the CrossFit games. If you start blowing chart. people out of the water and crushing shit and you want to contact us and tell us how you're doing going into a certain part of the year, whether you should switch over to MFT, that's totally fine. But normally our advice is to switch in the other direction. And last but not least, if you're going to be competing at the open or quarterfinals level in the age group divisions, teens and masters, you would follow the age group program. Anything you guys want to add to that? I mean, that's, I, I try to be as straightforward as possible. Leave your ego out of this. If you are not like stomping on people's throats in daily in the hatchet program, um, you should not be at it. Everybody should have at least one person they work out with or knows of their capacity and ask them that question. Hey, when's the last time you saw me at semifinals? Oh, never? All right, I'll do hatchet. <laughs> Got it. Okay. <laughs> That's the question. That's the question you should ask yourself. When's the last time you, you were at semifinals? Never? Yeah, Great, hatchet. Every year. I, had back, <laughs> I had a backpack and some seltzers in the stands. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, 12 seltzers. I'll, I, not, let me, I'll just touch on it real yeah. quick, Drew. It's just the, like, you do not get better by doing the hardest program possible, okay? Like, man, I want to get better at football. I'm going to go to an NFL training camp. I want to like, see that. Put that on fucking yeah. TV. 
yeah that, that well that's what that's what well, that's what i think when i see somebody signed up for mft and i'm like hmm click clack where are they out on the open leaderboard ah yes fifty seven thousand six hundred and twenty fourth. this will go well like that ain't it okay you don't you choose the program that allows you to get the most intensity out of the out of your training and statistically like the majority of people fall into that hatchet category like there is a very very small number of athletes who go to semifinals or a higher level and therefore again <laughs> math like most of us are going to follow that hatchet program and we just had examples kelly kelly followed hatchet all year because just because that was what her training time and intensity allowed for rather than beating the crap out of her with super heavy weights high volume gymnastics and stuff like that that we would expect for an individual who's dedicating a shitload of training time recovery time all that sort of stuff Mo a lot of people are just aren't in that camp and that's not to say like the mft program is for no one it's just for a smaller demographic of people um and hatchet is where most of us would live should live yeah i mean it's for like if you combine men women and teams it's for like three or four hundred people on earth total all right yeah. that's me and obviously that's what yeah, you're getting at i got finally understood it's for me there you go it is top, you'd, that, top 300 in this gym right now i'm top 300 in my gym right now <laughs> <Damn it. laughs> congratulations sure i'm gonna, I'm gonna get a poster made um all right so choosing Putting you your right program, up next to pukey <laughs> choosing your program you got pukey in a fucking chokehold sorry Ooh, go ahead. one other thing that i will say last thing on choosing your program and this one might remove the ego from it and allow you to make a better decision the most programmed movements at semifinals are running and the echo bike those Thanks, movements will never <laughs> be in the open or quarterfinals in the way that they are in the other and at semifinals we have to plan to peak an athlete in the month of may not march or april to be able to run and sit on that stupid fan bike for god knows how long probably multiple times just that alone like we're not going to bias those things heavily other than to get just generic adaptation and energy systems like we do in crossfit in the hatchet program it wouldn't make any sense to do that if we're going to specialize or bias something it should be something that we do on a more regular basis once we're into phase one two and three so that's my yeah i think that that's there. actually a super important point is just understanding that the programs will you know it doesn't matter quite as much now but as we get closer to the season like the programs are going to peak for the purpose of a different thing and if you're like you know i'm gonna follow the mft program even though i'm not a semifinals athlete well you are not gonna be as prepared as you could be for the stages that you need to be good at in order to get to semifinals it's like you you're not it's kind of counterintuitive you're not training using the program that you at the level that you want to be use the program that matches up with the level that you currently are all right um you guys will love this the volume in phase zero should be very low and the intensity should be very high Hunter, all right can you, read you had me, me halfway you had me halfway i'm <laughs> in the low the high stuff yeah hunter can you read me the instructions from the mft program so this is the, this is for semifinals level athletes what do we got? for the duration of phase zero pick pieces based on data points you need to perform in order to inform your training for the upcoming year if you've recently performed tests uh, that pop up from day to day you may choose to do them again or select from other pieces for mft level athletes we recommend at minimum one lift one conditioning slash interval slash slash bitch work one and total one, out of those three categories, one out of correct. those three yes. categories and one skill then pick one to two additional pieces only if time energy and intensity allows and I'm going to put another thing to think about into what he just said. There's a reason why we give you a full week in advance on Fitter. You're going to be able to see the entire program for the week. When you're making your choices, you're not just deciding what you can execute on in that day. If you have a 10K row the following day, if you have you know a, a time trial on the run, if you have 
um, a, you know, a piece with high volume gymnastics over the course of the whole thing and a misfit benchmark. You should be making the choices of if you have extras at all. And if so, what are they based on those decisions? We are coming out of this with as much information as possible to attack 27 weeks of programming that can completely change you as an athlete for 2025. So it's really important to think about it from that perspective. Do I have a rest day coming up? What is going on the rest of the week? Really take the time to look at that. And we think that you will have extra time because you're, you should be cutting down on trading volume some days by 20 or 30 minutes. So you should be able to really lock into that. So, um, I'll just say so important to get into the mode of like, we are testing a lot of these things. They're not training pieces. Are we taking the extra time to do a little bit of math and think about what our strategy will be? Are we warming up the way that we should? Are we cooling down the way that we should? Are we making sure that our, you know, nutrition and hydration numbers are where they should be? All that good stuff. So really important to think about this from a low volume, extremely high intensity standpoint. That's what we're looking for in phase zero. And it's just a little nudge to kind of get you ready um, and get you back into that mindset for phase one. Go look at semifinals and see how many workouts they do each day. <laughs> there you go. True. You go to the yeah. CrossFit Games, we can have a different conversation. But go look at semifinals. I mean, even the CrossFit Games. Go look at quarterfinals. The CrossFit True. Games is like high volume within a four-day stretch for sure. But a lot of it has to do with the fact that they're like, we don't want you to have arms when this is over. Yeah. I, like every year you program mock games, people are like, dude, you're going to, they're fucking, how do you expect them to do that many gymnastics reps? Like, I don't know. Ask Dave. <laughs> what do you want me to say? <laughs> like that's what they ask for. Yep. Um, the AB choices are also super important. So Hunter alluded to the fact that you'll go in and let's start with the lifting. Um, if you've done, it says find a one rep max power snatch and it'll also tell you how many opportunities you have over the course of the phase to test it. So that could pop up two or three times. Um, so it'll say, you have two more chances to test this. You are deciding between, am I doing this today or am I doing option B? And option B will be the same lift, but traditional lifting, you know, sets, reps, percentages, that sort of thing. So you're deciding each day when you go to look at the lift, do I need to test this slash do I want to test it today? If there are more chances and then if the answer is no you have option b right there we have the exact same thing within the bitch work if you're going down through and you're like i've tested this recently i've tested this recently there are options again to do traditional rounds of you know amrap this amount of time or row this distance run this distance etc so you're going to have options on lifting and bitch work pieces where you're going in and making those choices um, and that should factor into what we talked about before with not only choosing your volume daily, but also having that look ahead. Yeah, that look ahead is super important. <laughs> Just thinking about the totality of an entire week and what that does to people and like how many of you have had this experience where you feel like a rock star Monday, Tuesday, and then Friday, Saturday, you're like, eh, the affiliate class sounds nice and the beach looks pretty good tomorrow. Like, Just think about that and what that actually means for your you know handful of weeks that you're doing this phase like how much or how accurate do you want the data to be do you want to have good data points for tests that are on monday tuesday and so so wednesday and who the fuck knows friday saturday or do you want to know every day of the week are, is literally your best shot your best effort so that you have the most accurate data point to go forward into the rest of the season so you know i think that the because you are provided the opportunity to see the entire week of you know programming and you know you have the bullseye on the dartboard. Like you, you make sure you hit the bullseyes where you need to. And then the other days you either choose to do the things that are, uh, you know, maybe not the test, but are training pieces, or you just say, fuck it. I should probably recover because I have, you know, three bullseyes the second half of next week. And I'm going to be fucking roasted if I just go gung ho this first week. All right. Uh, we got to do it again. I don't know how many times we've talked about this, I actually kind of want to try to be a little mean, a little rude. So if you guys want to tap in. Oh, come on. Fuck you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's my job. Training versus testing. Never heard of it. If you do a test, let's say phase one starts and you do your front squat toes to bar test. 
And then eight weeks later, you do that you test again. You are not going to like it. And you do worse. I'm not even sure that it's athlete IQ. I think it's just IQ. If you can't <laughs> do a workout for the first time and then just game a better score, you are losing out on <laughs> such a huge part of what the sport actually is. Like, I watched certain athletes at semifinals implode in round one of that run clean and jerk workout. It's fascinating to watch. And then I watched other athletes draft off of people and just fucking cruise past them to a top five finish at the end. Just beautiful to watch. Love seeing that stuff. If you don't know how to, I think most people know how to do it. Like if, if the memory didn't have to be that long, like if you got to do it again the next week or you got to do it weekly, you'd probably figure out what was going on there. But I can tell how quickly I'm going to be able to help a remote athlete based on their notes when I'm like, tell me everything that you can think of about your test and how it went. I'm talking sets, reps, transitions, mentality, whatever it is. Give me every bit of information that you can and make sure you do it when it's fresh. If an athlete is like, I think I did this. My transitions were okay. The dew point. I didn't was. like it. It's like, <laughs> uh, sick. This is where, this is tough. I'm gonna have to give you literally prompts for the next time, which is fine. So, when you are doing these workouts, getting into the mode of figuring out how to game a workout is so important. We have seven weeks in the middle of phase one, seven weeks in the middle of phase two, seven weeks in the middle of phase three, where they're stimulus based workouts. You're going to be able to personalize your strategy to improve on what you need to improve on your energy systems. I want to lock in on this movement. I want to progressions on my toast bar, whatever it is. You're going to have 21 out of 27 weeks to be able to do that. But if you don't learn how to game workouts and improve on them, you're not going to be able to use the stuff that you got when you get to the open, when you get to quarterfinals. So not only are we testing the actual things, we are testing your ability to strategize and to improve on things. Whatever, 70, 80% of you listening to this or people that are following this have already done these benchmarks. You should know what you can do in the absence of an improvement of fitness to get better at this test if you had the right notes from the last time, unless you, you know, took a bunch of time off from training this summer or something like that. So I really want to put it out there. These workouts, you are supposed to get the best time possible while adhering to standards, et cetera. I feel like that goes without saying. But man, <laughs> what a fucking bummer that someone could just outsmart you in a workout that didn't work as hard as you over the course of a whole season. Fuck that. Do both. I mean, lighting your hair on fire is is how you get started, right? It's like when you wander into the affiliate for the first time, the first year, couple even couple of years that you're doing CrossFit, you're supposed to just get buried because you're an idiot. And you just go too hard and you don't know any different. And there's some, there's a little bit of ignorance is bliss and plausible deniability there. And it doesn't makes me smile ear to ear when I watch somebody who's relatively oh, new, yeah. just set their hair on fire on that first 400 meter run of the 20, 20 minute AMRAP. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, to be dumb again, like, like what a time to be alive but at some point you graduate from that because your aspirations are to compete at a high level and part of that is is learning how workouts are like everybody who programs a workout is thinking about anywhere anybody who's programming at a high level is thinking about like how's this supposed to go at what point is the athlete supposed to get buried and what am i expecting somebody to get from a score perspective and the athletes at the highest level aren't that far behind the programmers from a knowledge perspective as far as like okay i see what they're doing here i understand that the ghd sit-ups uh you know are going to be harder because i'm skiing and it you know always refer to the first quarterfinals workout when everybody realized that you can't climb rope without your abs because you do a bunch of ghd sit-ups and then you can't lift your knees to climb the rope and it's like what the fuck's happening in the meantime we're like hey your abs and hip flexors are going to be fucked so enjoy this workout <laughs> um but there is an element of you you got to pay attention you got to understand that you know 
part of getting better at the sport is being smart enough to outsmart your competitors. Shreb, anything? I just got, I was just going to say the the mental fitness, the mental reps for a lot of athletes are is the reason they haven't <laughs> they haven't leveled up. They're wor hard workers, they're consistent, but they just can't get themselves they can't set their ego aside or they can't take the extra time or just you know, something inside of them doesn't allow them to chill the fuck out and actually pace the first round of a 20 minute workout or to intentionally break up the first 10 toes to bar because 10 toes to bar are a joke. It's not about the first 10 toes to bar. It's about the total package. It's about what happens from minutes 12 to 15 and human beings, you know, as a species are just typically terrible at seeing what future consequences they'll have. They're here and now. I'll be fine 12 minutes into this workout. It's like, well, based on the fact that your round split went from three minutes to five minutes, like clearly that wasn't the case. And it's just, that's a hard thing to do. But like, you know, that's why people get remote coaches. It's like, hey, I'm gonna tell you exactly how to do this in hopes of teaching you a lesson of that, like, hey, this workout that has the, you know, the semifinal workout has the muscle ups, three, six, nine, 12 and front squats, it's like, listen, trust me when I say break up the set of six muscle ups, even though six muscle ups aren't your max, see what happens. Oh, look at that, you went a minute and a half faster. That's huge. It's not about who does the coolest sets, who lifts the heaviest weights, unless that's the test. It's about who can get the most work done in the least amount of time. And like, it's so hard for athletes to make that connection that your mind is the reason you're being held back. It's not your willingness, it's not your commitment, it's, it's the fact that you won't spend the time between your own ears questioning why you wanna do something a certain way and then not being willing to try something else. Yeah, and you make the jump from, you understand why it happens. Like, you make the jump from affiliate class, in affiliate class, we are first and foremost chasing, like, stimulus. Like, can we get this person real revved up in this? That is going to manipulate their metabolic conditioning um, the most, right? Like, probably my favorite one of all time was just this last year was the row deadlift double under. Because the open workout. Was, yeah, it was such a stark, like, example of what would this look like in affiliate class if it was just randomly programmed. And then what would this look like when athletes are trying to get their best score? Um, and I can think of an example where someone who was hands down significantly fitter than the other person and vice versa, the other person was significantly more intelligent than the person that was fitter than them. <laughs> and the workout got done and they blasted the person through listening to the coach and understanding kind of the math behind it. And we just had this conversation of like, I don't know, like that person wanted to do better and now they're pissed or whatever, but that was, that was 20 minutes of zone five. Like there's some serious metabolic adaptation going on over there. You were probably flirting between low end zone four and zone five, kind of back and forth. You know, you a little bit more dynamic in the double unders and the deadlifts, but then you'd back off, you'd come back. So, um, and there is a, a push pull there. Like eventually if, you know, we're talking about, I want to get more muscular, like in back over there, does a hundred toes to bar in a workout and you do 40, he's probably going to get a little bit more jacked than you. Um, so like eventually you want to make your way through this stuff, but I just thought it was such a cool example of that. And lets me understand that someone who is competitive and does push hard, how they could end up on the wrong side of that athlete IQ equation. But if you show up year after year with us to get after it and you don't get any better at that, it's, man, that's tough. <laughs> that's real yeah. tough. Yeah, I would argue for most of those people, it's not physical. <laughs> it's mental. And that's a hard thing to, to oh, digest. Dude, 100%. <laughs> yeah. It's a hard thing you to digest. You want me to row at what? I can't row at that. I'm a good rower. I'm tall. I'm in really good shape. It's like, yeah, but that means that the rowing at this pace will make it easier to do the deadlifts and the double unders. And like, oh man, some people, you have that conversation, like, like, you know me, like I'm going to have like a seven minute conversation with a member who doesn't even know who I am. And then they're going to be at 1800 <laughs> calories per hour. And I'm like, wait, what, what the fuck <laughs> What's happening right now? I was so happy when they doing? brought back that. We 16. just talked. They Thank you for your that. expertise. I will take that under advisement. Got yeah, it. 142. Oh it's the, the huh. open workout from last year, the 60, 50, 40, 30 workout. 
is it 20 at the end? Yeah, 20 at the end. I'd be like, all right, guys, you're going to be on the rower for like three minutes. The rower only can ruin your workout. You can't make yeah. your workout. <laughs> Fucking blasting 1750 on the rower. I'm like, all right, you're going to be off the rower at two minutes, and then you're going to do nothing for the next 10. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. You're sick, though. All right. Um, last but not least, a little bit of a phase one teaser. So we get through these five weeks and then we, we begin phase one. Um, I'm really, for the reason that we just addressed, I'm really going to lean in and push test week and retest week this year from the standpoint of not a lot of volume surrounding outside of the tests um, and really trying to get people to post their scores, to compare their scores because we do so much training and I think a lot of people are lacking in the testing department, you can practice your ability to execute over the course of the next five weeks in a really big way. You are given tests with every stimulus in every time domain. Can you learn how to execute on those things over the course of the next five weeks? Because you're only going to have two total Metcon tests when you go into phase one. There's one Metcon, one interval. Um, is there something that you can take from phase zero that is not physical adaptation? Can you learn that mental piece that both you guys pointed out? Like, can you figure out how to game a workout and then go in and do a lot of work on the specific stuff, get yourself better in the way that you need to, and then retest with both? I am fitter, I am stronger, I am more skilled. And I'm more smart. I'm more smarter. I'm yeah, smarter. More smarter. About, That's how I am about this <laughs> than I was when I started because I didn't have the information on it. So that's just a little bit of a preview of me. I'm going to push that a lot more this year than we have in the past, because I think it is the missing element from so many athletes. Like they continue to come back. They continue to work hard. They continue to get better, but their strategy piece is just completely missing we need to find a way to make that not the case while still training versus testing most of the time. Fuck. I think if anything could make the community of Misfits better at large, it's that everyone agreeing to come together and post scores and chat and engage. Yeah. Like there's, I think everybody that's had that experience in their past, maybe in their local community at their gym, even that's, that started an affiliate class or you had a competitor's class and you're, or, you know, open gym and you all worked it together, like how much fitter you all got because you were constantly comparing and sharing notes and talking about how things went. Like there's so much value in that expression and there's so much opportunity to learn from what other people pay attention to that maybe you do not pay attention to. And that could be the reason why you finally figure out that like, hey, the, you know, the first set of toes to bar need to be five, three, two, instead of all 10 in a row because this is a 15 minute Metcon and I gotta be able to keep, stay moving the whole time. So, you know, the the peak expression of how a community can help an athlete is through um you know participation and paying it forward realizing that like by going in there and talking yourself you might bring someone else out of their shell who might bring someone else out of their shell and next thing you know there's 40 people talking about you know double under row <laughs> deadlift and you all learn from each other and guess what lo and behold next year you add a round to your workout just because you went from starting at a 149 pace and you went up to a 153 and you held 153 the whole time. Got any final thoughts, Auntie? Um, no, not, not nothing, nothing profound. I think just taking the opportunity to use phase zero as a, as a bit of a like reset and kind of just like we talked about at the beginning, it's really important that if you've been doing this for long enough and so you're you're listening to a competitive CrossFit podcast, which implies that you either are just interested in CrossFit or are interested in competing at a high level, you have to understand that in order to compete at a high level, you have to have one logged enough training hours and training time to you know, to have simply have the fitness to get to that level. But two, because you've been doing it for as long as you have, there's a chance that like those numbers might not go up every single year or every single time that you test one rep maxes or your 5k row or your one mile run or whatever. And it's important to understand where you're at right now, given the circumstances that you're working with, because the odds that the circumstances are exactly the same as they were two years ago when you hit your all-time best, you know, lifts and conditioning pieces, 
it's probably not realistic that you're in the exact same spot. Maybe you are, maybe you're in a better spot and awesome, great, but that won't be the case every single year. So the annual opportunity to kind of check in with where you're at this year shouldn't be thought of as like, oh, fuck, I'm getting less fit because I back squatted 10 pounds less than I ever have. Because there are a shitload of opportunities to say like, wow, but my 75 strict handstand pushups for time, that went super, that went way better than it did previously. There are just so many opportunities to improve in different areas that to assume that everything is all going to rise together and at the same time is unrealistic and a really easy way to to get discouraged. So don't do that. Look for the Look for the little wins where you can find them, especially if you've been doing this for a while. Phase zero begins Monday, August 5th. You can get signed up at misfitathletics.com. Um, five weeks of baseline testing. You've got your lifts, you've got your misfit benchmarks, monostructural time trials. Um, Hunter alluded to the, the athlete IQ chipper practice where you're going to be given a large dose of a, of a single movement to, to figure out how to work your way through. Um, I, I think you know, my mind goes to, you're probably going to be 10% better come February, March, if you have the information that you need from phase zero. Um, so while, you know, asking at this point in the season for lower volume and extremely high intensity is like, woof, here we go. Um, maybe haven't done that in a little bit of while coming off of the season. It's the kind of thing that can set you up to, um, have a pretty incredible 2025. So if you've been on the fence for a little while, please don't wait until phase one. Um, that's not a, a sales kind of thing. It's us giving a shit about how well you do in our program. So, um, misfitathletics.com Monday, August 5th, make sure you get signed up. Thank you for tuning into another episode of the misfit podcast. And thank you to our show sponsors, sharpen the axe Use your favorite athlete code, properfuel.co. Use the code word misfit. Talked a lot about misfitathletics.com Monday, August 5th. Um, and make sure you head to teammisfit.com if you are looking for our affiliate programming. Uh, we will be off next week at the CrossFit Games, and we will see you the following week with more information about affiliate programming phase one. Cheers.